Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Leacox and uh, I'm a nursery and extension specialist at the University of Maryland. I'm a professor in, that de in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture. Um, today I'm going to talk about using sensor networks to monitor and control irrigation events in nursery and greenhouse operations. And um, typically I think most people are familiar with the monitoring side of using sensor networks, um, but we're engaged in a very nice uh, um, project, long-term five-year project, uh, with Decacon Devices as one of our partners uh, that is really looking at pushing the envelope on developing control uh, strategies for nursery and greenhouse systems. So just uh, give you a brief outline of uh, the webinar today. Uh, I wanted to just talk to you about, um, not, not assuming that you don't, not all of you know about the nursery and greenhouse industry in the United States, talk about the industry, what it looks like, and some of the operational efficiencies in the industry. Um, I'm going to focus in on the Chesapeake Bay in particular and some of the current challenges we face uh, in irrigation, water and nutrient management uh, for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I'm going to then kind of switch gears a little and talk about our SERI Mines project. It's called Managing Irrigation and, and uh, nutrition via distributed sensing, that's what MINES means. Um, then really get into a little bit about sensor networks, what we're doing, and particularly illustrate the need for control. Um, and really focus in on a couple of case studies where we're actually uh, looking at using various tools to actually achieve uh, what we call set point control. And then just to finish up a little bit about water savings, our current water savings, and the economic benefits uh, that we're beginning to see from this project. So uh, just to give you a very, very brief overview of what our industry looks like, it's, it's really segmented into three types of operations. The first type is the field uh, nursery operation. Uh, that is uh, uh, this picture here. It's a typical tree farm in soil, uh, grass meadows in the rows, and quite quite intensive. Uh, as you can see, these maples are quite uh, closely planted. Um, typically, they, they could be uh, thinned out um, in years three and four, but this is long-term production in soil. Kind of an intermediary, um, um, this is what we call a pot and pot operation. It's still growing large trees, but typically these are grown in 10, 15, uh, 25, 20, 25, and 45 gallon pots, and that's uh, about 160 liters, perhaps 180 liters uh, for a 45 gallon pot. So that's that's quite big. Um, these trees are are um, also very large. Um, typically, the production cycles are shorter, though, and it's a more intensive uh, production scenario because what they do is they use soilless substrates in these containers. A soilless substrate being a pine bar or perhaps a, um, um, some kind of artificial media uh, where they are, are not using soil because soil is extremely heavy and uh, expensive to ship. The next type of container nursery is probably one that most, most are familiar with. Um, this is where a lot of smaller type shrub material, um, annuals, perennials, herbaceous perennials are grown in smaller containers, typically anything up to about a 10 gallon um, or a, a 40 liter size. Uh, but typically a lot of these annuals are in uh, four liter, uh, maybe eight liter, uh, one and two gallon size containers. And as you can see, they're very, very diverse. Uh, a lot of these operations will um, grow perhaps three to 400 different species of plants and uh, not, t not typically in contiguous blocks. Uh, this really does make irrigation management very difficult. Um, a lot of these operations are on overhead irrigation. Um, some are quite tightly uh, spaced, uh, like you see in this picture, but then when these canopies get large, you have to space them out. And of course, if you're on overhead irrigation, um, your efficiencies really drop down. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then lastly, greenhouse operations. Um, this is perhaps an atypical greenhouse operation because this is uh, just a picture of poinsettias. Uh, th this is what we call a flood floor. 
Um, this is a very advanced greenhouse. Um, it's actually courtesy of uh, Rutgers University, uh, who loaned me this picture. Um, and so, but there are a lot of uh, greenhouse operations who are very advanced, um, recycle all of their nutrient and water uh, in, in big, large uh, underground systems. Um, some greenhouse operations are on micro sprinkler or boom irrigation um, overhead, but typically they're very, very dense. Um, small material, this is probably the largest type of material you'd see in the greenhouse. Um, this is perhaps a one gallon part or perhaps a little bit larger, what we call a 12 inch part. Um, and so typically um, where your annuals and bedding, bedding plants are grown, um, uh, what you typically see in a, in a Lowe's or a Home Depot, those bedding plants are, are typically grown in a greenhouse operation. So. Given all of these different diversity of, of operations in the nursery and greenhouse industry, you can, you can imagine how diverse the irrigation systems are and, and what uh, me and many others in the United States are, are um, trying to do is actually uh, figure out how we can make these systems much more efficient um, in terms of not only their water use, uh, but also their nutrient use. And I'll, I'll show a little graphic in a few slides where I try to illustrate how water management and irrigation and nutrient management are all interrelated. And so you really can't just think about one uh, particular um, part of an operation uh, in isolation. You have to think of it together. Uh, current efficiencies, uh, as you can see, there's a very broad range, and that broad range is because uh, typically with irrigation, overhead irrigation systems, depending on the plant size, uh, you could be as low as 20%, what we call interception efficiency. And interception efficiency is the amount of water that, that you apply would actually be intercepted by any one given plant. Um, up at uh, 60, 70, 80 percent, that's when you get um, drip irrigation systems, uh, single pot uh, micro, sp micro sprinkler, sprinkler irrigations. And so those are typically are much more precise, uh, they're much more easily controlled, and of course all of that water goes in the pot, so that effi those efficiencies are much, much higher. Uh, contrast that with our nutrient, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus efficiencies. Um, those typically are 10 to 60 percent. That's for various reasons because of different forms of fertilizer that are be being applied. On the right hand slide you can see the uh, uh, slow release fertilizer in that picture um, has been applied to the top of the plant. Um, you do get volatilization losses, you get leaching losses, um, and um, so the, the plant really has to kind of fight to retain or, or actually compete uh, in terms of nutrient uptake for those nutrients. Um, so that's why we're really focused on irrigation management because um, typically this is, this is the reality of many nurseries. Um, um, this is a container nursery, actually a very good container nursery. They, they have um, uh, lined furrows, uh, they recapture their water. That water is not just running off, it's actually running off actually into a pond. And so what we do in many container nurseries is they do have these ponds on site. Uh, they do recycle a lot of that water. Um, and uh, it, so it goes back two, three, four, or perhaps even perhaps five times to the crop. Um, but of course, if it's accumulating nitrogen and, and phosphorus in particular, uh, you tend to get um, algae blooms in, in summer when the when the uh, temperatures are, are warm. And so it, it becomes a runoff issue. Of course, we've got pesticide and herbicide uh, runoff issues. And so uh, really the key um, to, to thinking about these systems is to, to understand that everything's synergistic. Um, if you look at the practice in terms of nutrient rates and the type of irrigation system, uh, you really need to understand how to manage that particular system. Uh, because we're really, and most growers are, are acutely aware of this, um, uh, in, try in trying to optimize efficiency. And lastly, if you can't uh, get it one way by optimizing efficiency, you really have to do something about it in terms of mitigation. Um, but mitigation is expensive, and so what we're really focused on is really the upstream side of things in terms of uh, really reducing the amount of water being applied to 
to uh, containers to plants. Uh, we're really focused on being as as efficient as we possibly can uh, with water. Not because, not only because it's a preci precious resource, um, um, particularly in many states that are prone to drought, and water is very expensive, uh, like in California, um, but because of the environmental issues as well. So water management really is the key to nutrient management and this is the graphic I was uh, referring to um, where I've just tried to put it all together on one slide. Um, obviously if you're an outdoor nursery you do have rainfall. Uh, rainfall supplements irrigation which is, which is a good thing um, but it's very difficult to control. But we can control irrigation amounts and so in terms of water application we're really focused on trying to reduce the leaching component, reduce the surface water component and absolutely maximize the amount of water in that root zone at any one time so we can minimize everything else in terms of leaching and, and runoff. So just to switch gears and just to focus a little bit on Maryland uh, um, because that's where, where I'm working and working with many other colleagues uh, on this project. Um, this project I'll tell you about in a little bit later though is a national project and so uh, we do face all of these issues all over the country and um, um, the reason we're focusing on the Chesapeake Bay of course is that uh, the Chesapeake Bay is a very large watershed. Uh, it's a very shallow tributary and so when you have a, a, sh a water watershed that's 64,000 square miles in size and it drains to a, probably one of the largest estuaries uh, in the northern hemisphere, um, what happens is that it ends up uh, collecting an awful lot of pollutants. And given that there's about 17 or so million people in this watershed, uh, there's an awful lot of human and uh, anthropogenic activity in this watershed, uh, including farming. So. Um, this is just a, a graphic to show some of the water quality concerns in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, it's, it's across all states. Um, Maryland has a lot of uh, the, it, because they're the end of the, it's the end of the streams, um, we deal with a lot of water quality concerns that, that literally just come downstream from other states. And so uh, as of 2010, um, there was a presidential order signed by President Obama that actually uh, uh, imposed a, uh, a what they call a total maximum daily load process on the Chesapeake Bay. So we've been trying to clean it up for about 20 or 25 years and quite frankly uh, we hadn't been doing a very good job of it and we still haven't, aren't, but now we're under a EPA mandate um, to actually do something about it. So just a little explanation of what a total maximum daily load is. Um, that's a the, the amount of a pollutant, and it's not just nutrients, uh, it could be pathogens, uh, fecal coliforms from animal operations, could be mercury from, from uh, uh, industrial applications, could be all sorts of things. Um, what we're concerned with as um, serving the farming community, of course, is, is nutrients and sediment. And so what that total maximum daily load actually means is it's the amount of pollutant that a watershed can um, mitigate on a daily basis. That's the total maximum daily load. And those criteria are set by the states and the EPA and um, they are set to basically set standards for water quality that uh, everybody has to meet, whether it be urbanites, whether it be um, farmers, whether it be um, industrial applications or even sewage treatment plants. Those mandated reductions, um, and there are two year milestones in this process, by 2025 uh, we're going to have to uh, reduce uh, almost 25% of the nitrogen, 24% of the phosphorus, and 20% of the sediment that goes into the Chesapeake Bay. And that is not just a Maryland responsibility, that's all six states in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia are the three biggest states, but it does include West Virginia, parts of New York State, parts of Delaware, and um, a little bit of West Virginia as well. Um, so that's an awful lot of nitrogen, almost 200 million pounds of nitrogen, 15 million pounds of phosphorus, and uh, yes, that's right, 7.3 billion pounds of sediment. 
Um, and in fact, sediment is one of our biggest pollutants because uh, that is uh, what submerges our aquatic vegetation. Uh, it uh, that destroys our oxygen uh, capa generating capacity in the bay, and it has all sorts of uh, uh, consequences downstream. So, uh, agriculture, just you, you probably can't read this on your screen, but uh, the purple is pretty much what agriculture is, is, is contributing uh, to this process. And uh, it's about uh, 35 odd percent uh, of uh, the nitrogen. It's um, almost, uh, I, just starting up the numbers, 45 percent of the phosphorus, and it's nearly 60 percent of the sediment load. And so we've got a major challenge on our hands um, to, to reduce these, these, um, these numbers. Uh, not to say that everybody do else doesn't, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge for all of us. So, switching gears, and uh, uh, this is the team that I'm uh, very happy to be uh, leading and working with in our uh, SERI project. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary, uh, multi-institutional group. Uh, they are, are really, as you can see, a really fun group to work with. Um, Colin Campbell and Lauren Bessie right up front there from Decagon Devices. But all the people, uh, graduate students and faculty members and advisory panel members and all people, this is a list of people, some of the people involved in the project, these are what we call the project leaders. But there are many, many other graduate students and undergraduate students and, and staff uh, working on the project and all contributing to the success of this. Um, I won't go into the, 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 all of the details of uh, our, our objectives, but it's safe to say that what we are is trying to develop next generation tools for the, uh, uh, for the nursery and greenhouse industry that are specific for our needs. And um, so the, the engineers at Carnegie Mellon and Decagon Devices have been working very hard in the last couple of years to develop a new uh, node that actually will not only monitor uh, sensor activity, but it'll also have a control capability. And I'm uh, very happy to, that we've just started implementing those in the last uh, six months or so. I'm going to share a few uh, uh, preliminary uh, details with you and some exciting results that we've had. Um, but we are doing many, many other activities. We're really trying to understand the physiology, the economics, uh, all of the benefits associated with this. And um, I'll, I have a graphic, here we go, of, of um, uh, what we're really trying to do with these sensor networks as a team. Um, so if you look on the left hand side there, um, what we have is nodes out in a production area. We're very focused not just on a very small scale like in a greenhouse, um, but we're focused on maybe deploying these sensor systems into uh, large nursery operations. Those could be um, uh, as large as uh, we've got one nursery grower who we're working with. We have eight nursery growers who are firmly embedded in this uh, project uh, in Georgia, Maryland, Tennessee, Ohio, uh, and in Colorado. And so what those growers are doing is act we're actually implementing these networks on their farms. And so this is just a graphical representation of some, some of what we're doing. Um, those nodes are out in different fields. Um, we use uh, indicator species to understand what uh, what crops we're monitoring. So we have a few key species that we've chosen that we're looking really intensively at to monitor, uh, but we are gradually expanding into different crops and different ornamental crops. We're all focused on ornamentals, but as you, as you could see, it didn't matter whether it were a greenhouse or a tree nursery, we're trying to cov cover the range of those, of those uh, species in ornament, ornamental species. So um, what, we're, what we're really focused on and what I'm going to illustrate today at the top is local irrigation control. Now that's a control that is uh, literally a, a node-based control. Um, that takes uh, information from the sensors um, and it is interpolated by the node and the node actually makes a decision to turn a solenoid on and off. And um, that node has been developed, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, it's uh, um, initially called an NR5. I'm not quite sure why it's called an NR5, but uh, uh, that's what it's called um, uh, at this point. Um, but what it needs, obviously, behind that is a, uh, is a software backbone to be able to, um, uh, uh, for, for 
for us to easily program it and to interface with that node. So the, that comes through a data station either to a local com computer on the farm um, or it goes to a remote server and, and most of our, our local control nodes are actually uh, going directly over the internet um, uh, from the from the computer so it can be accessed from any any place at any time uh, we can also mirror that data on a remote server um, if we wanted to to ensure that um, uh, we had uh, adequate speed on that on that network um, so that that I'll get into a little bit and I'm going to show you uh, some graphics so uh, some actual data uh, that we've recently collected from from one of our sites um, obviously uh, from a utility point of view, um, we really want to be able to access this data from any place and any time. And so we're really focused on, uh, at this point, we all of our applications are, are remote and then we can pick them up on an iPad from, or an iPad or a Droid from uh, anywhere in the world if you've got an internet connection. Um, we also have a 3G capability, um, which um, uh, Decagon currently has already. So there are various ways that this, this information can be transmitted to a smartphone or a handheld device um, anywhere in the world. And so, so depending on the situation, depending on how rural the situation is, we, there's a number of options that we can use to be able to do this. So this is um, questions that, that quite honestly get asked, we get asked quite often, so I thought I'd um, address them here. Um, so why, why sensor networks? Um, a lot of people say, well, why do you need sensor networks? Uh, why is irrigation so hard? Um, um, well, actually irrigation is, is not hard, is not easy. Um, uh, probably the hardest question for a grower to, to, to answer accurately is, do I need to irrigate today? Because an experienced person will be able to judge that and to say, well, he's, yes, it hasn't rained for two days and it's been very hot the last couple of days or it's been very cloudy and cool, so I, so I really don't need the irrigation. I could uh, irrigate, I could skip some blocks. But then there are some species that use a lot of water uh, that probably would need to be irrigated today. And then there's some other species which are very slow growing that, uh, quite frankly, you could probably skip. But uh, somebody who really doesn't is not familiar with the plant species or their water use or their growth rates it's it's really hard to ju make that judgment and it's all about how many how much root they have what's their growth stage and so it, it does be to become very difficult to to make that decision correctly uh, on a consistent basis so um, Obviously, most growers in our business do irrigate, um, but surprisingly, very few of them actually monitor, actively monitor their practices. They'll go out, they'll lift pots, or they'll look at uh, trees, they'll look for wilt, signs of wilt. Um, but honestly, before, if it gets to wilt, uh, it's oftentimes too late. You've impacted growth rate already by the time uh, you see uh, crops wilting in the field. So. We need to really move from precision irrigation, which is what we've illustrated. You can do that with drip, with micro sprinkler, with uh, boom sprinklers in the in a greenhouse. Um, but what we need to move to is precision plus decision agriculture. It's the decision part of agriculture or, or decision part of irrigation management, which really is the key to providing um, much better, much higher quality information to a grower. And growers, quite rightly, typically won't change practice until you convince them that it's either going to help their bottom line, it's going to increase their profitability, or quite frankly, it'll increase, uh, improve their, profit, uh, their productivity. Uh, for example, their growth rate. So that's, that's obviously tied to prof profitability, but quality is sometimes uh, a very important um, uh, consideration for many growers. So when we Im implement these sensor networks, they, they, we, we need to be very careful because that technology, uh, there's a few key features that really that technology needs to, um, uh, it needs to be very sound. It needs to be cost effective. 
Um, that means that it needs to be uh, robust, it, uh, the sensors need to work well, they need to uh, be accurate. It means that you can set them up quickly and easily. You could probably do an initial calibration, but in a short period of time you could actually be collecting data. Um, and of course, um, once those systems are deployed, you want them to literally have um, low maintenance uh, as much as possible. Obviously, everything needs maintenance, even in, even your car, um, and you wouldn't you wouldn't not maintain your car. So uh, networks do need maintenance, um, uh, but more importantly, on on the back end of things, when you're collecting sensor net sensor data, you can collect an awful lot of information in a very short amount of time. The true key to being able to use information, of course, is how you can effectively uh, visualize it, how you can graphically show it to somebody who uh, really doesn't it doesn't have the time to uh, get into all the nitty-gritty details of it. So we, you, you have to use software to be able to uh, make these deci decisions in a very short window of time. And, and we, our decision window is a five-minute decision window. Uh, we, we set a standard, if, if, you, if a grower can't see what he needs to see in five minutes, um, we're, not, we're not meeting the challenge. We're not um, uh, really um, helping him improve his management because most often he's time limited. So, on to a few uh, examples, and I'm going to focus in on one particular example. Uh, this is a pot and pot nursery operation. It's part of our project. Um, we're doing some very interesting uh, work there. Um, we're focusing on two indicator species. Um, uh, um, uh, these in the front foreground are dogwoods. That was actually a, a shot in the winter. They, they've leafed out by now. But as you can see, um, he's growing these particular um, uh, trees in a 15 gallon container. That's a 15 gallon container. And it's what we call a pot and pot operation, as I mentioned earlier. So that pot actually sits in a what we call a socket pot. Um, so it's a pot in a pot. And uh, they do that for two major reasons. Number one, overwintering, to protect the root ball from extreme temperatures, and quite frankly, to stop them blowing over. Um, it's, as it's as simple as that. Um, when you get a lot of these containers uh, in a field and they blow over, uh, it, it, it becomes a real mess. So, and so these, this system is typically uh, irrigated with a micro sprinkler. You can't quite see it there. I think I have a shot of it, um, but uh, just by the handle of the pot, uh, you can see a little bit of a loop. Uh, that's, that's the micro sprinkler there, and uh, that goes to an underground, underground lateral uh, irrigation t uh, pipe, which is all um, uh, then plumbed in uh, across the farm. So this is just a graphic uh, of, uh, actually it's the web page for our sensor network. Um, this is not DataTrack. If some of you are familiar with DataTrack, uh, this isn't DataTrack. We are developing a next generation tool. Um, we needed to develop a, a software tool that would uh, be almost as good as DataTrack, but obviously have the control capabilities that we could actually talk to these nodes and we could actually send them commands. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. This is an overview of this one particular nursery. As you can see, it's quite large. It's about uh, 200 acres in, op, uh, in extent, just the pot and pot side of it. And um, so um, what this uh, piece of software allows us to do, um, we call it sensor web uh, for the want of a better, better word, but it allows us to not only monitor the data in real time, but it also allows us to make adjustments to the irrigation schedules over the internet and uh, you you may notice that those blue bars at the bottom of the um, of the um, uh, graphic there that's what we call our macro scheduler that's where we can take our daily window of time and the the light blue corresponds to the time time during the day that we we can actually say okay well we can irrigate these blocks not that it's going to but that's the window where it's allowed to actually uh, schedule because obviously there are many other blocks on this uh, farm and so we need to obviously give uh, overlap these windows so that all blocks can have um, 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 a reasonable amount of uh, water. 
We have two uh, irrigation and monitoring monitoring and control blocks on this farm. I'm just going to show you the one. Uh, we have a maple uh, block, which is two inch uh, maple trees. They're about uh, uh, 14, inch, uh, 14 foot high at this point, um, th uh, two year old maple trees and um, then the dogwood block are three year old trees, uh, they're about an inch and a half in diameter, fairly sizable tree uh, and those are the low, lower part of the farm. So I've described the macro uh, irrigation scheduling control but this is really uh, the heart of our control capability uh, in the software and this is what we call our micropulse uh, routine. So within each one of those windows, I'll just go back, within each one of those blue windows what happens is that means that the uh, water is available to actually irrigate that block. Uh, from the pump and that basically saves, uh, uh, configures the, the pump uh, to be active. Um, the micropulse routine uh, then sets the time uh, at which the pulse duration can is, is active. So in this particular instance I've, we've selected Micropulse 2. You can configure your own Micropulse routines. You can see there's a number of them there. Uh, but for this particular block we've chosen that a Micropulse it would be at uh, 120 seconds on and then 180 seconds off. Now what that does is if the sensors uh, get to a set point and I'll just go forward uh, two slides and then I'll, oh, uh, let me go back. Um, I'll describe it when I actually get to some, some uh, uh, graphs in a little bit. But what happens is when the set point of the sensors uh, average gets to a certain point, that micropulse routine will come on and it will actually deliver 120 seconds of water to that part and then it will switch off for 180 seconds and all the time it's actually um, uh, actually still the sensors are still sensing and if the set point actually gets above the minimum set point it won't irrigate again but if it needs further irrigation then it'll go through another micropulse routine and it'll give it another 120 seconds and so by doing this these micropulses what it basically does is it puts a very little amount of water, small amount of water on the top of the pot and it lets it slowly move through the pot. Um, and if it needs a, a second uh, irrigation, then it'll give another, another irrigation. By doing this, what we can do is minimize the leaching uh, of any particular one irrigation event. Because typically what we find is if you give a long irrigation duration to these um, to these containers uh, after uh, a couple of minutes it's basically just leaching through the bottom of the pot and you're lo losing a lot of water and a lot of nutrients and I'll show you some data to actually prove that. So this is the, map the dogwood block at this particular operation and just to show the, uh, the uh, solenoid farm at, for this particular block um, and what we have done is selected two rows of trees. Uh, this is just looking towards the bottom of the, that rose. Um, but uh, looking up the hill, um, basically what we've got is a monitoring row on the left hand side. There's 133 trees in that row and a control row at the right and that's uh, another 133 trees. We're actively monitoring five trees in each row and what we're doing is we have uh, two 10HS uh, Decacon sensors, one at 6 inches and one at 12 inches. Um, we actually have some new of their GS3 sensors in those trees as well. That's the, we're monitoring EC uh, in those. We won't uh, talk about that today but that's also part of our project where we're monitoring the electrical conductivity of salts in those parts. Um, the monitored row is actually scheduled by the control by the grower. He's um, he's the person who is basically irrigating that row of trees. The trees on the right, the control row, uh, are actually being irrigated by our team, and we decide um, at what set points um, uh, we are doing those. Now. Given that this, I'll tell you that this this operation is a long way from Maryland. It's actually in another state. It's in the state of Tennessee. So it's not exactly something that we can uh, just uh, uh, jump in the truck and and go and and um, um, 
and visit uh, very often. So um, it's a true test of our long, long distance uh, capabilities uh, to be able to do that. Because of that, we have an EM50R, which is the typical wireless monitoring node at the end of this row, and that acts as a safety check for us and ensures that we're getting adequate water at the end of the row and that we're not, we're not irrigating the bottom end of this uh, row because it's uphill and starving the trees over the hill. So we, we have some uh, um, um, safety checks in place. So this is the inside of the, uh, uh, the NR50, uh, NR5 node. Um, uh, this one's a little special actually. This one's, uh, what we've done is we've configured this one to actually hook up to a latching solenoid. And that's pretty interesting because that means that we can go into a farm situation and we don't need power uh, to actually operate solenoid valves. The node actually operates that solenoid, so it turns it on and off, and it's done with those five batteries that are in that node. And so, uh, thanks to our engineers and and uh, and uh, our partnership with Decagon, we've been able to achieve actually some very very um, uh, impressive engineering goals in terms of power management. As you can see, we've also got a flow meter on this uh, particular. Um, uh, row. In fact, we have, it's almost a standard practice for us now to put flow meters on these, uh, particularly from a research perspective, because uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, good um, tool for a grower to be able to look at, as well as our, ourselves, to be able to understand what are the impacts of, of these irrigation events on, on uh, actual water use. The other four ports are taken up by the 10, 10 HS uh, sensors uh, in this uh, particular row, and so the actual irrigation decision is made. Each one of those sensors is in, a, is in a different tree, and so what we do is we make the irrigation decision based upon uh, an average of four sensors. Now, to, just to show you some data. So as you see in this chart, um, uh, this is the, the monitoring row. So this is the row that the grower is actually um, irrigating. And as you can see, he typically um, uh, irrigates three to four times a day. Um, you, you might think that's a lot, um, particularly if you're from an from a agronomic background. Um, but remember, these are quite large trees in relatively small containers, and they have very porous soilless substrate in them. So even the grower, prior to us implementing uh, the, the sensor-based control, he, was, he is and, and still is doing a very good job at what we call cyclic irrigation. Cyclic irrigation is where you put on a small amount of water uh, three or four times a day, and that really helps to optimize water use. Um, so I just before I move off the slide, just uh, take a note at how sharp those peaks are, because um, that's, that's an interesting, that's what I thought was a typical irrigation signature peak, um, and that basically what that means is the volumetric water content, which is indicated on the left, is going up with an irrigation event, and the red line that is gradually creeping up the, uh, across the slide, that is flow meter data, and that's on the right hand um, side of the right hand uh, y axis, and at the end of the um, couple of days ago, it was just about 2,000 gallons he had used since the beginning of the month. Um, so you can actually see the small increments in gallonage as uh, each day. Now, this is the dogwood control block, and I've uh, I've actually zoomed out uh, in for, for almost three months since we started this study. I did this for a very um, uh, specific reason because I wanted to show you how this node was actually increasing the periods or the durations of irrigation uh, over time. And as you can see, back in April when it was relatively cool and, uh, and, and moist, uh, we were only irrigating uh, once or perhaps twice a day, and those irrigation durations were very short, one minute or two minutes uh, at most. And as we went, got into uh, May, uh, those advanced uh, to to uh, majority being two and sometimes four, and then when we get up to um, uh, this in June when it's uh, much, much warmer, trees are growing very actively, they've really got a lot of leaf on them, they're using a lot of water, uh, that's when we're up to sometimes four and, and eight 
uh, uh, minute uh, pulse pulse time. So that an eight minute would be four pulse pulses in in an irrigation event. But this uh, uh, shows you that in fact the irrigation signatures on the control block are very different. With that micropulse routine it means that we don't get those very sharp water peaks because what that actually means is the water is going on much more gradually and as it passes the sensor it's just very slowly increasing in water content and then it'll drop down again and then it maybe rise up again. So you can see the three signatures. One tree is reading fairly high because it's, um, uh, it's probably a little smaller or it doesn't have as much leaf. Um, the other two trees are are quite nicely in sync um, and so what we do is we take an average of those trees um, and so the on set point in this particular block I just overlaid that uh, is currently it's 46 percent that's where we we are comfortable uh, with that particular uh, set point that's the set point that we also came to when we looked at the end of the row um, we actually changed that um, uh, at a, a few weeks ago uh, because we thought that we were under irrigating those trees a little bit. So just to show you what the grower is doing, uh, typically he's putting on four minute irrigation events four times, four or sometimes five times a day um, and that uh, is, a, is a long duration time which produces a very sharp peak and what happens is uh, that not only uses a lot of water um, but it actually results in quite a lot of leaching um, uh, from that pot on any, from any one of those irrigation events. In contrast, the control events are much shorter and each pulse tends to be 21 gallons uh, per two minute pulse and so those irrigation events are much shorter and so we typically are using uh, a lot less water and I'm actually going to show you some data. Uh, uh, running, running total data at the moment to do that. Before I do that though I wanted to just show you some of the leaching data that we're collecting from these pots um, and so before we changed the micropulse routine um, uh, last month um, we were getting a lot lower leaching um, from our uh, control trees. Uh, we did bump that up and so you can see we're getting somewhat uh, higher leaching but when you consider the, the volume, uh, that's in liters, so between a half and a liter of, less than a liter of, of um, uh, leachate per tree compared to about 80 liters of water use per day, um, that's a, that's a, uh, a, a relatively